So, uh, welcome everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Greg Batson. Uh, I'm a member of the annual conference as an uh, elder and a pastor. I've served uh, three different churches in our annual conference uh, over the last uh, 15 years. Uh, as an associate pastor at Santa Monica First, as the senior pastor at Burbank First United Methodist Church, and then uh, at Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Tustin. Uh, but three years ago, uh, the board of the uh, California Pacific United Methodist Foundation and the bishop saw fit that I should serve there as president and CEO. So I've oh, now oh, just okay. Uh, okay. finished three years uh, in that role. Um, I have on that back table, you might want to pass, there's some green brochures. Can you see them right behind you there? Uh, feel free to pass those out. Those are just... Uh, Overall brochures uh, provide a quick overview about the foundation uh, and what we do. Uh, let me try to give you the, the nickel tour of that very quickly. Um, our foundation is a separate nonprofit uh, charity uh, that serves our annual conference. So it's the same boundaries, uh, Southern California, Hawaii. But our primary role is uh, to provide stewardship education and to help churches in managing their endowment investments, their long-term investments, uh, and to help promote giving uh, to those endowments and long-term funds. And I'm going to speak more about that today as part of my presentation, okay? But you'll see our contact information there, our website. Please feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Uh, I spend most of my time on the road. Uh, visiting with local churches, uh, Methodist-related nonprofits, our districts, annual conference, uh, on how to raise long-term funds, uh, and then helping to do that with our investment program. We manage about $60 million in assets for uh, our annual conference. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, stewardship holistically, uh, not just the pledge campaign, but all the different aspects of stewardship that we should be engaged in at the local church level. But before I launch into it, I'd love to just uh, hear from you. Uh, if you could please introduce yourself, uh, your name, your role within your local church, and which local church are you serving. And, and if you have any particular questions or concerns, we're going to have a lot of time for questions and answers, so I welcome that throughout the presentation. Would you like to start? I'll start. My yeah. name is Joyce Rose. I'm treasurer for the Sherman Oaks United Methodist Church, and I'm also a member of our endowment foundation what? of the board there. And uh, one of the things I really want to do is, is uh, monetary stewardship needs to be sort of ongoing. We tend to hit mm -hmm. it and go on. So I'm just here for information. Great. Thank you. So I'm Ed Glasco, and I'm a finance chairman at the Burbank First United Methodist Church. Thanks, uh, I'm Yutha Hankinson. I'm the treasurer for Scott Pasadena mm -hmm. and the treasurer for UMW Conference. Wonderful. Okay. I'm uh, Al Coleman um, from Malibu United Methodist and I'm the church council chairperson. Great. I'm Georgia Terrian, a member of this church mm -hmm. and chair of the SBRC. Just here to get information. Wonderful. I'm Mike Easterly from here at Northridge, mm -hmm. and I'm chairman of the uh, missions committee, mm -hmm. and we depend very heavily on our endowment fund and the foundation at the church, and I'm also president of the foundation. Great. Thank you. In the back? Yes, my name is Tim Conte. I'm an old um, MC, mm -hmm. and I'm a part of the finance committee. Great. Joyce Thompson, an old Methodist Church. And I'm the ex treasurer and also the financial chair and a member of the Great. Great. Yeah, I'm a member of the finance committee. Okay. Joseph Choi, a pastor at this church, North Great. Great. Welcome, everyone. It's great to have a cross section from out throughout the North District and for us to be able to share. Um, I want to start with a reminder. Uh, about this, and I do, I do truly believe in this and think it's very important. And that is that stewardship, or if we just use the, uh, the term fundraising, is, <coughs> is a ministry. <coughs> and it's rooted in that. In fact, if it's not rooted in that in terms of the church, it's not going to be successful. Um, because 
it is part and parcel of our discipleship uh, throughout the Bible. I just led a, uh, a workshop for our clergy earlier this week uh, about scripture text and looking at scriptures in terms of how it informs our stewardship campaigns and what we do with it. And we're reminded that over and over again in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, how we handle our money, our property, our resources is as much a part of our faith as it is in everything else that we do, whether it's prayer or worship or reaching out with care and concern to others. And uh, you may be familiar with Henry Nouwen, famous uh, Roman Catholic uh, theologian uh, who has passed away now. Uh, but he had some things to say about uh, fundraising, and I like this quote in particular. From the perspective of the gospel, fundraising is not a response to a crisis. Fundraising is, first and foremost, a form of ministry. It is a way of announcing our vision and inviting other people into our mission. Fundraising is precisely the opposite of begging. I love that last line. Because it's so true. How many times in the local church have we gotten to the end of the year and we're trying to meet apportionments and close the gap and we feel like what? We're begging. Begging. <laughs> I'll say it. <laughs> From the pulpit and letters and everything else. But when we do that, we have to remind ourselves that people and our members uh, do not respond in their giving to begging. Uh, or to a crisis, even though we can acknowledge a crisis and say, hey, we, are, we don't have enough funds, we're not going to make it. That is not why people give. People give because it's part of their spiritual formation, and they believe in this, that it's ministry. That what, what they are contributing to is something greater than themselves, and for the greater good. So we can never lose sight of that because over and over again I've seen this in the local churches I've served and the ones I've consulted with in my current role. Uh, when we keep that in perspective, then we have a healthy fundraising ministry. Uh, because it's not about meeting the budget. People don't say, I just want to give money so we can help close the gap. They need to know that this is going to something important uh, in Christian ministry and it's important for their faith development. Okay, so let's keep that in mind as we're talking about uh, all of this. When I talk about holistic um, stewardship, this is what I mean. Here are the four main components of it, and I'm going to go more into endowment since that's my uh, specialization now. But we often get caught up in the first one, pledges, right? We all have pledge campaigns, so you might do it in the fall. Some churches are now moving it to the spring, after Easter, uh, or even before. There's different times of year, but we think about this because we know that that's what it takes to run the church budget, to pay the staff salaries, to help pay our apportionments, to pay the utilities and the light bill. But then we get a little tunnel vision sometimes when we're sitting on finance or other committees and say it's just about pledges. Stewardship is not just about pledges. Uh, it's an important part because it also includes missions and outreach. It includes capital campaigns, especially for the renovation and upkeep of our facilities. And it includes endowments. And I'll talk more about what an endowment means and what it can do for you. Can yes, Jim. Can add one thing? Sorry yes. to interrupt, but one of the things we discovered, I discovered at Palmdale after 24 years of hearing us do campaigns and things, is we figured out that we had to go to campaigns twice a year, mm -hmm. and now once a quarter. Mm -hmm. So we're asking the next generation of givers to consider what can you don't, what can you commit to for three months, uh -huh. because their perspective of a year is impossible. They're not sure if they're going to have that same job in a year. Mm -hmm. They're not sure if they're going to be living in that community in a year. Right. And so the annual campaign became less and less support, mm -hmm. but we went to six-month campaigns, and now it looks like that church, I'm no longer there, but the pastor who's serving there now is looking at quarterly. Because when we ask for three months at a time, a lot of churches will find that people can envision three months. And they'll commit 
more every three months mm -hmm. than they ever would over six months or over a year. So right. many campaigns twice a year, four mm -hmm. times a year becomes a, more about electronic giving and those things that I'm sure you're right. into. And, and that's a great point because uh, I've talked with many givers and what we do find in an annual campaign, even for those people who <coughs> have pledged for a long time and it's part of their faith, they'll, they will pledge the the base amount, the smallest amount that they think they can do. They might add on top of that, but they're going to do a safe amount that they're going to do. So if you're going every three months, you're more likely to, or six months, to get people to step up to what they really will do. And it helps a lot in terms of your planning as well. So I think it's a great point on that. And, and I thank you for adding it, Jim. And, uh, and I also uh, consider doing it at different times of the year. We get stuck in doing it in the fall. And sometimes... Um, um, we might find that within the, the worship life of the church or liturgically or where we are as a church, uh, it might make sense to do it at a different time of year. Like I suggested, like a, some people do it in January, some people do it between Easter and Pentecost. There's all kinds of options. Okay? Okay, pledge campaigns. So you know what this is for, right? You're supporting the day-to-day -day ministries of the church. <laughs> Uh, the pastor, the staff, program expenses, utilities, facilities maintenance. And when I say that, I mean regular ongoing maintenance. That should be part of your line item budgets. You know, what does it take to replace the light bulbs, um, to keep the facility clean? Those are ongoing. You know you're going to have those expenses. You incorporate them into your pledge campaign and your budget. And, of course, apportionments. And apportionments are a big part of what we do. Uh, you probably all just received uh, or heard about the letter or email. We had a very good year in apportionments this past year, which was able to fund things beyond our local church. Uh, annual campaign, fall or spring, consider those options. And there are a variety of programs. Uh, can you give me a little sense of what you are currently doing now in your local churches? Are you using a set program or do you come up with this? in your stewardship committee, or do you just say, Pastor, you take it, and <laughs> we'll follow along? In, what have you found to be successful or not successful in your local churches right now? Well, I, 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 there's a lady that's over stewardship, and, and I didn't, I'm not saying it's successful, but she does it once a year, and it's done in January. Okay. And, um, and, and we have a consecration Sunday, Sunday. at the mm -hmm. end of it. And then um, basically she sends them back at six months what they have, the card that they filled out so that they can get a, a grip of what they actually did. Mm -hmm. What they did, which is six months valuation, and what they said they were going to do. Oh, it's okay. Just, just so that they were aware of that situation okay. at, at the six months interval. And basically that's, and it is for the budget and so forth. So. Okay. All right, good. Thank you for sharing that. Yes? We do a harvest supper first on the Saturday before we start our campaign. Okay, and so. that is a thank you. And um, we say it's the start of our finance campaign, but we don't talk about finance, do we? But we provide that food, mm -hmm. and, it's a, and we announce that it's thank you for what you've done, like we're reaping the harvest for what we've done, and we yes. look forward to the next year. And then the following Sunday, we get, um, for the next four weeks, we have people out of the church stand up there in church and tell them what the church means to them. Okay. And then on Consecration Sunday, we hand out the pledge cards. Okay, great. So uh, some people on a con uh, will have uh, a meal. Uh, you've described one at the beginning of the campaign, okay. or, or as, as a pre-campaign, I'll say, as, okay. a, as a thank you. And we should thank our, our those who regularly give and pledge. Or sometimes people on their consecration Sunday will do the pledge cards, consecration, and then have a meal afterwards. And that's a gentleman by the name of Herb Miller has put together the consecration Sunday program. That's what he suggests on that end. And so, we do bring food and we have the finance committee bring the, we always have coffee and right. cooking biscuits after. Because on that Sunday we bring more and the finance committee bring everything. And we do do that as a celebration. Okay, good. Good. Others? Yes. Well, our past Judy decided, you know, we needed to step up and talk about tithing. Mm -hmm. So he started a very short uh, 
stewardship moment mm -hmm. every week. Now, some people are getting a little tired of this, but let me tell you, it did boost the uh, the the giving quite a bit. So you saw the impact of it. Well, we saw the impact of it. We were able to pay our apportionments at the end of the year, not in January, after calling everybody on the mm. phone that we knew might be willing to okay. support the work further, you know. And this was the first year we've done that in a long time. And what type of uh, ministries were highlighted, or, or or what did people talk about when they? Uh, we, we different people in our congregation would mm -hmm. do it. Would talk about uh, the the difficulties or what it meant to them spiritually, and okay. what they got out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and the fact that God takes care of you. I always say we never tithed. We gave a goodly sum, and then. For some reason, it hit us both at the same time, and we talked about this, that that was God's work, mm. that we decided we need to. We had five children. We raised them in L.A. Mm. We both worked, you know. Right. What are we going to do if we try it? Well, let's try it. And we did, and believe it or not, we actually did better financially, and I think it was because we knew we were giving this, so we had to watch what we spent mm -hmm. a little careful. Mm -hmm. But it... Yeah, you know, which was amazing to me right. was that it worked. Right. <laughs> and that was like 40 yeah. years ago as our kids are all old. Yes. Just piggybacking on what she said, one throughout this month when we're doing it, um, people get up and make testimonies. Mm -hmm. And I do believe testimonies make a difference. When people tell the real truth, they, it convicted me. Right. You know, and and even if you convict one person right. to feel that that's what they're supposed to do, you've done, you know, it's not everybody, but when one person get up and tell you their true story, you know, they're not glorified and all godly. Yes, this is what I did, and this is how I felt, and how I changed it. You know, like the story you just told. Somewhere you hit somebody's heart, mm -hmm. and they are realized it is not about me. Right. You know, right. it's about why I committed to being a Christian in the first right. place. So what, you, what you're all sharing is when you have that sharing from other lay people in the congregation about what the giving personally means to them, uh, a personal story or witness or testimony in that way, uh, and and what is meaningful and, and what they see the church doing, that gets to this point here. It's not budget focused at that point, it's ministry focused. It's it's hitting, like you said, people at, at, in their heart about why they should give, not just because we have a dollar amount to meet. So I think those testimonies, especially from lay people, as part of your pledge campaign, or you can intersperse them throughout the year. That's I don't know if I do it every week, but I maybe <laughs> once a month. <laughs> once a month, you commit in your worship planning with the pastor or whatever to highlight a ministry, or have a layperson get up and, and share about the, a particular ministry and giving. Um, that can have a great impact um, as part of it. Uh, and then if you do it in worship, you're getting your widest audience. Mm -hmm. Because now when we write a letter, some people will read the letter. Yeah. You do an email, some people will read the email and not others. Um, so this needs to be incorporated into your worship life of, uh, of sharing it. Um, if you do it throughout the year, it's called year-round stewardship in that way, right? If you focus on it each month, and then you just have one Sunday where you do consecrate or collect pledges. All of those are viable models as long as they look at the spirituality. All right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just to amplify what you're saying is, people tend to give if they have a tangible thing that they're giving to. Yes. Um, just to give to help balance the budget, it seems harder to sell than to give to some mm -hmm. tangible item. The one exception that we have is that we were changing ministers at mid-year. And so I wanted to balance the budget so that the outgoing minister could leave knowing the budget was balanced. And the new minister would come in not being saddled with a, a hole to have to dig out of. So the people contributed to balance the budget that way. Yeah. Later in the year, we had not been making capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. 
and so we had some catching up to do. So we had three items we wanted to address. Uh, stained glass windows, fix the leaks, the organ was missing notes, mm -hmm. and we needed to have uh, better audio visual equipment like you have. Um, and so for three Sundays in a row, we would have a layperson get up mm -hmm. and talk about stained glass windows and where you get them repaired and what was involved in doing that. And then the second one on the organ, we had the organist try to play a scale. <laughs> and you could recognize notes that were missing and people didn't realize that mm -hmm. she had to tailor her music to how the organ played. And the choir members would say, and we hear the hissing yeah. of the <laughs> air escaping that you don't hear out in the congregation. The, the choirs are up against the pipes there. And so that kind of hit home. Yeah. And then the visual equipment, uh, you could see, you know, like what you're doing here versus a mm -hmm. professional approach. So both uh, items, uh, people contributed. Yeah, that's I was worried at the end of the year that they'd be willing to contribute again mm -hmm. after having the mid-year campaign that they did came through both times. I think what people, especially in our churches, we, we are concerned about whether they can have the capacity or will they do it again. When, when a need is demonstrated, and it's demonstrated in a way that it's, it, that it's necessary or helping the church uh, in its outreach and its service, people do respond. They will go the extra mile. Yes? I have a question because our, our, our congregation definitely responds when there's a mm -hmm. need and you put out an extra call for whatever. But not everybody shortens their giving, their regular giving, but some does because it always shows yeah, up you're in gonna, the regular giving. You're going to get a little sure. bit of that. Um, I, was, I didn't know if there was any way to, you know. <laughs> but, but do you see that overall, if you added both numbers together, it it's should be still, greater yeah. than you than you started out. So, oh, yeah. I mean, some people will decide to do that, and there is a danger. So, uh, let me let me because if I've got way. if I've got money going to something particular, uh -huh. it goes to that something particular, right? Which leaves us maybe a little short over here. And right. Money. So I'm gonna. That's a great segue to this one um, because the second aspect I put on here is missions and outreach. But the reason I put missions and outreach is pre precisely because of this. It's um, as Ed just mentioned, it's easy. It's always easier to raise money for a specific need, okay? Whether it's a capital need or, in this case, missions and outreach, right? Uh, if you say we are sending four missionaries uh, to uh, Zimbabwe and we need to raise the funds to do that and support that program, you're going to get twice as much money as if you had put that as a line item in your pledge budget mm -hmm. because hopefully you would have those people get up explain the ministry say why they're going what the meaning of it is and when people hear that they tend to give more. Mm -hmm. it is it is just part of our human nature mm -hmm. because the more well specific and more well defined the ministry that you're supporting the more support you will get so the examples I gave are mission trips Camping, if you have a bunch of kids, like at my previous church, who go to camping, who love it, never had problems raising money to send kids to camp. Because even if somebody else wasn't going to, hadn't done it in a long time themselves, they wanted to see another generation do it. Okay, uh, Vacation Bible School, usually a big outreach program for our churches. You should be able to get plenty of support for people to support VBS. Homeless shelters, food programs. The balance you have to write run within your finance committees and your stewardship campaigns is to say, now let's not do so many of these that are specific that you undermine your pledge campaign. There's a balance there. So you have to be strategic in planning it out during the year to say, okay, when are we asking for a mission trip or VBS or some other special ministry so that it doesn't eat into your pledge campaign as well. That's why having a meeting 
with your finance team, with your pastor, with whomever you consider to be in charge of stewardship. It could be trustees, it could be endowment committee, groups from all, people, representatives from all of those places. You need to sit down and kind of calendar it out and say, when are we asking for money? And what are we asking for? And is it specific or is it the pledge campaign? Okay, so there's two components right there already. Now to make it even more complicated, right? <laughs> Capital campaigns. How many of you have uh, maintenance issues on your campus uh, that need to be dealt with that are fairly sizable? If you've got a church of any age. Well, yeah. we, we're yeah. starting an air-conditioned thing. We've got one section, and, mm -hmm. and the trustees say, I guarantee you the others are going to go because they're just that old. Right. So this is beyond the regular maintenance. So you're right. beyond the, the regular is, yeah. maintenance budget, and you know you have a... $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 repair out there. Uh, in the previous churches I've served, I did, we had to do the, the roof for part of the building at Burbank. I remember that in particular. Um, we had to replace a, a, a large air conditioning unit. It was one of those big two-ton units. You know, Those are not cheap. Um, you need to consider a separate campaign for capital campaigns on top of that to raise dollars for physical facilities beyond normal maintenance and repair. Or, of course, especially when you're looking at an even bigger project, which is adding a building or expanding a facility, which you have to work through your district at that point and usually have to raise either get some debt uh, to help finance it. Um, but these can be done, or to pay off a mortgage if you have an existing mortgage on your property. Usually these are three to five year commitments on top of your pledge campaign. Okay, so it has to be very specific. It has to give people enough time to step up and give an extra pledge to do this specifically for this, this capital project. And you can, if, if it's a really big project, there are a lot of consultants out there that you can engage to do it. The, the issue is you're going to have to pay consultants a fee. And usually it's a sizable fee depending on the size of the project. But there's one group, for instance, called Horizons. That's a United Methodist stewardship group. It's national. Dr. Uh, Cliff, Cliff uh, Christopher is the head of that. You can bring somebody in if it's a really big project. But if you're doing just a replacement, usually you can do those on your own. You, don't, you, you only need, a, I think, a capital campaign uh, consultant if you're actually going to build a new building or totally renovate a facility. But if you've got to replace a roof or an air conditioner or a furnace or something of that nature, consider that in your planning as well. And you've got to work with your trustees. This is where you've got to work with your trustees. Your trustees have to come up with a list of here's what's going to go, what's the priority, and then start attacking those with those special campaigns. Okay? Now, there's a fourth part of this. So usually you say there's a stool with three legs, right? This is a chair with four legs. And that's endowments and long-term funds. So on the foundation side, this is what we special in, specialize in. And this is a part that gets forgotten sometimes in local churches as part of stewardship. But it's just as much of stewardship as pledges and missions and capital campaigns are. And that is raising long-term funds. When we say long-term, we're talking longer than five years, okay? And it's different type of giving. It's not giving out of your pocket now. It's not writing a check out of your check uh, account now or doing an electronic transfer. It's out of future giving, i.e. when you pass away, okay? And that's why people don't talk about it as much because people don't like about talking about when they're going to pass away and what's going to happen. But I've got news for you. It's going to happen to all of us. The other good news, the gospel is, we're all going to experience resurrection and new life afterwards. But we often forget to talk about this as part of stewardship planning for our members. And when we do, we forget to ask for a gift for the church. Every other nonprofit and charity in the world out there is asking for a gift in your will or in a gift annuity when you pass away. And often the church doesn't. So I'm going to 
go through a little bit more in depth on this, but the most common is bequest through wills and trust. Uh, everyone should have a will or a trust. There's a lot of bad things that happen when you don't. When you do, we should make, hopefully, a gift to the church. And you can see where this does not compete with your pledges or your mission and uh, uh, missional giving or even your capital campaign because these are, are coming out of funds from your estate. However, this is by far and away the biggest source of income for endowments is being included in wills and trust. All right? Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about gift annuities and a lot of different ways. I got a couple of brochures of how you could designate the church as a beneficiary on these uh, financial instruments that are growing, IRAs. A lot of people now have IRAs that are mature and they're able to pull from. The law now allows you to give directly from your IRA to the church and not even count it as income. It's a great advantage for the giver and for the church. Life insurance policies, etc. So I'll go into more detail with that uh, with another uh, PowerPoint real quick, but let me pause there while I'm doing that and um, ask you what questions do you have so far about holistic stewardship, e any of these components? Um, are any of you using electronic giving at all? Yes. We're, we're looking into it right now. You are? Yeah. Okay. I am totally confused with electronic giving. We had <clears throat> people in our congregation who really wanted this, and so one guy helped set it up with the gal who was going to take over his treasure. Mm -hmm. And we've got a PayPal button on our website somewhere, and I don't go on our website that often. And then come to find out, the gal who was supposedly taking over it. Anyway, she just didn't have any time. She was young. She had a lot of work and family mm -hmm. commitments. So I found out there was over $1,000 in there that wasn't in our account at the end of the oh. year. So now I've got to figure out how to make sure the giver got credited mm -hmm. with that money, but it's not in our books yet, but now it is being... But now I've got to figure out... I've got to go on there every month and transfer money over. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is not... You know, I get into the church office and I have like two or three hours and I've got to make sure payroll's mm -hmm. done and all the bills are paid. And you know. what um, do you know? What service you're using in terms of who's who's collecting the electronic transfers in terms of the PayPal does it, and you've got PayPal. to sign into their website okay. and request it to be transferred to your bank. Okay. So and I haven't done that yet. She okay. did it for me right. this time. So that's how it so was. So I'm set having up. to learn a new trick, and I. I know that's <laughs> hard. That's hard. <laughs> There are some real let me, there are some real advantages to this, um, and this a lot of this is generational too. So, um, my you mean wife another I, generation. Treasure. Yeah, well, I still write <laughs> some checks for things, right? But more and more, I am paying everything electronically. Um, and it for costs the too. Hmm? I mean, it costs too. There's a fee with each one of those it depends. transfers. It, de it depends, right? Uh, there are services where you can do it that it does not cost anything for the giver. So one in particular that a lot of Methodist churches use is called Vanco, V-A-N-C-O. V-A-N-C-O, Vanco. They're one. There are uh, probably two or three others. You can just look up electronic church giving online. Okay. And they will not charge a fee to the giver and a very small fee to the church. And in the long run it's worthwhile. And I'll tell you the reason why. Number one, you have a whole generation of people younger than me uh, yeah. who that is the only way they give. If you ask them for a check, they would not be able to give you a check because they don't have one. So you are missing out on their possible financial contribution if you don't have a way for them to electronically give because everything is done online. You will have some people who give only by check and they don't trust anything electronically. So your stewardship and your finance, you have to have both avenues covered in that way. Mike, did you have a question or is it something yeah, you want to add? Most, most banks also allow you to automatically send a check on a monthly basis or every other week or whatever you want and there, there's no charge either way Right. In, in, in those cases. So it actually generates a check but you didn't generate it. 
You yeah, set it I up. know. I, I like you those. Set it up. We get those okay. too. Right. Uh, but we do a fair amount uh, that comes in through credit card as well, and, and yeah, something. Right. You know, the treasurer has to do something. Yeah. For, no, well, we have a credit event. card too. They can come in the office and swipe their card after. Oh, okay. Huh. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't do that. <laughs> but they charge for that too. You know? Well, yeah, they do. And, right. and, and I will say, credit cards will charge more. Right. That's that gets up into the two to two and a half percent per transaction. Yeah. These others, like Banco, if they're taking straight from somebody's uh, checking account as a bank draft, it's it's a much much smaller fee that you're having to pay. The advantages are that, um, how do you see your giving patterns, for instance, right? They go, uh, they do pretty well at the beginning of the year. You get past uh, Easter and Pentecost, you get into summer, you get the summer dip, right? You start to work your way back up and they peak in December. If you have people give online electronically, you're going to even that out so that you have a more even cash flow coming in each and every month because it's just coming straight out of their account. They don't have to remember to write a check. They're not out of town. People don't come to church every Sunday anyway. More and more studies show people show up who are regular members and givers who show up two times a month rather than every Sunday. And you're not missing those, those gifts. So we're finding that, yes, checks and others are still important, but a growing percentage of it is going to be happening electronically. So we have to, and it sounds like you got put in a situation where somebody set something up, they're gone, and now you're having to fix it. But there are some ways to, works. To, yeah. to, to fix I'll it and move it forward. Out. Yeah. Um, other, other aspects of that that people have encountered, either good or bad? Well, like I said, we're in the process of looking into it, mm -hmm. so I'm hearing what you guys are saying. But, um, and also making sure that we get the right people doing the right thing. Right. Because we started our financial secretary on doing church pro for her entering. Mm -hmm. So we're working through that you right. know, because she's not a teenager. So uh, and, and so to add something else we have to make sure that whoever's doing it is ready to, right. to do it because whenever you do something there's some kind of learning Yes. For, for the person that right. is going to manage it. And so, um, so, so your business administrator, financial secretary, whoever is in charge of yeah, that, receiving... That, 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 that financial secretary is the part. Yes. I, I'm the yeah. treasurer, but I don't do that. Yeah, you get to write the checks I going get, out. That's right. right. Um, so she has to, so we just, she just finally figured out the church pro and doing that automatic, you know, that way. Right. So, so we're le we're getting into that. So sometimes you have to move slow when when they are not twenty. Absolutely, anymore. absolutely. Yeah. But you will find the we advantage find, of it. We find we find, we know that it's something we want to go into. Right. But we also look at our congregation, and our congregation is more on the check writing side than the other. But mm -hmm. we we have to look in the positive side that. We're going to get right. the others. And I'm certainly not saying don't accept checks. Obviously, oh, you can't. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. That's not going to happen. Right. But you do. But do, do offer But we need both. the options. Yeah, yes. That's right. what we've realized. Right. Um, it's just like having a website. I mean, you can spend a lot of time on websites, and it's all fine and good. But you got to have something that functions because sometimes that's the only people, the only way people are going to be in touch that's with right. the church too. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. You, ha you have to have that presence. That's right. Okay. Yes. It's kind of hard. You know, your very first statement was that it's a part of the ministry. Mm -hmm. But when something's coming out automatically, you, you forget that that's, that's part of your ministry. Mm -hmm. With too much automation. There's something about writing that check, putting that thing in the offering plate that gives you a, a, a sense of a, more yeah. sense, I think, of the, of the giving. I, I, I maybe mean, that's just old school. But I, I, I think there's something to that. Well, I, 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 I guess there are other... Uh, Charities that I give like that, and and I feel just that I if I give to you, I'm feel I I'm giving to you because I like what your what charity doing. is yeah. doing, mm -hmm. and if I've decided to give that money to that charity, I'd like to see what that's doing, and I don't want to get bogged down remembering if I wrote them a check or if I didn't, you know. So um, so it. I, and I do still feel that it's a ministry 
because I, I committed, just like I commit to the Lord, I committed to your charity. It's that's what I do, you know. And it's it just you know. And you can offer a service where if somebody's giving electronically to provide them a card or something. Oh, that's a good idea. And it's and it, it says I have given online <laughs> or electronically this amount, but it gives it it, it it provides that sense of putting it in the collection plate and being part of that <laughs> overall offering. Yeah. It's it's uh, included just, in there. Just as a side story, uh, the day we turned in our pledge cards and putting them in the offering plate, or, or yes, we right. have a Joash chest we use. Um, someone asked someone else, would you put mine in there too? And that person got inside it. No, this has got to be a personal commitment. This is you know, this whole guilt thing. That, <laughs> so there, there is, there is, there are people who feel this way. And yes, that's why, that's why I mentioned. It. Yeah, oh, absolutely, think, there is. I think it's interesting. My younger daughter, she does her annual budget, and they, she belongs to a rather large Episcopal church. Her husband used to be a Catholic, so mm -hmm. that's sort of where they went. Is it? Nice, but anyway, nice in between ground for them. But, but anyway, because they both make a lot more money than their parents do, yeah, you know, they, they're always invited to dinners with mm -hmm. the pastor who tells them about the, the the building campaign and the this. So they very carefully plan their budget every year, and, and they give to the Lord, and then it comes out of their bank accounts automatically. They do that once a year, but they angst over it. Mm -hmm. And they give a lot of thought to it, and they're giving, yeah, you know, That's but they don't have the same connection to checks that I do, or you do. <laughs> yeah, I, I've fallen out of love with checks. <laughs> I do online, my my bills are paid online, but I, I, I've fallen out with checks. It's a waste of, you know, there are a couple of places that you still have to do them, but it's, it's very small. All right, so there yet another component for you to take and make sure you're covering in some way in, in your, your, yep, in, yeah, your okay. committees. All right, uh, let me talk a little bit uh, more about planned giving in a little more detail on here. Uh, there are three common planned gifts uh, that people use um, to fund endowments and, and long-term funds. And an endowment, as defined, is a a chunk of money that somebody gives to the church where you're supposed to protect the principal. Not dip into the, the gift itself, but just use the earnings from the gift <coughs> in your investments to fund ministry. And that's the, that, so it's restricted by the donor, or if it's a gift that's been given to the church and the church has decided to restrict it, uh, where you don't use the principal, that's an endowment. <laughs> And your charge as uh, trustees or an endowment committee is to invest those funds wisely, try to earn as much as you can, to, to use those earnings to support whatever it is it is to be supported, whether it's the general church budget or missions or facilities, uh, without endangering the principal. Sometimes you can have gifts that have no strings attached whatsoever. Those do a happy dance when those happen. Uh, because that gives the church the ability to say, is this endowment or not? Is Can this be used uh, principal and earnings, or do we just want to reserve it just for earnings? And, and for what? Um, but they are very, very powerful gifts. You could have some large gifts uh, that happen that can take you up in the 500000 to a $1 million range very quickly. And I've seen plenty of op uh, examples of churches I've worked with who are not the largest churches, but they've been very focused on this, and they have almost a million dollars in endowment funds. That can provide up to 20% of your budget uh, if you're that successful with it. And it allows you to not fret as much about getting 100% of your funding from your pledges all the time as that goes up and down. So a bequest. I mentioned this earlier. Very simple. A bequest is when you're giving a gift to a charity in this case the church, at death. And the donor wishes to benefit that charity and they put a provision in their will or their trust to do so. Uh, it could be one sentence, often they are. One little line in a will that says, I wish to give X number of dollars or even better, X percent of our net estate to fill in the church name. Now here's the catch. How many people out there do you think 
in America and adults do not have wills or trust, what percentage? 60. Uh, even higher, 70 is yes, the... 70. 70 percent of people do not have a will or a living trust uh, at any adult age. Um, here's the issue with that. When you don't have a will, at least a will, uh, your estate, when you pass, is not in control, your family does not control what happens to it. The state law, probate law, decides what happens to your estate. So it goes into the court system. Your, uh, uh, you have to go to the court for permission on listing all the assets, on paying any bills of the estate, and then the state decides by their own formula how the estate is divided up. Uh, that happened to my father. My father passed away at 60. He had his own small business. He did not have a will or a trust. It took us a year and a half to go through the estate. Uh, it was expensive because we had to hire a lawyer to help us go through, the, uh, through it. And um, my mom, God bless her, did not have any say in how it would be divided up. Uh, so it, it, it causes tensions in the family, it's expensive, and you have no control. So I always say that part of wise stewardship that should be a part of your ministry is encouraging people in your church to at least put together a will or a living trust. Yes? Uh, we had some, it just a thought, we had some free workshops put on by a couple of members of our church. Mm -hmm. And he would bring different people for different things. Right. And one of them he brought in uh, to talk about wills and trusts. Mm -hmm. And this was an attorney. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he explained the whole genre, which was about maybe an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And everybody wasn't there, but right. I, I know for a fact it, he got some people. And he said, because you came to this workshop, he waived the cost of his um, what is it, the fee that mm -hmm. he talks to you and tell you all about mm -hmm. it because he's told you a lot about it in the past. And um, and so then you, and his fee was normal, you know, but but he, it, it's it's a thing to, at least you, you offer this free workshop or this free informational thing and people come out and they're doing it again. They have a four of them. They talk about homes and sellings and mm -hmm. different things about once every two months and um, so it it's just an informational thing that uh, mm -hmm. that I know for a fact that this uh, attorney got business from it and so right and that's very uh, I have been a part of presentations where I've had attorneys with me at a local church the local church mm -hmm. and suggest someone uh, it's very helpful as long as the church doesn't say you have to use this person, oh no, you're no, okay. no, no, no! Yeah. It was just an informational right, thing, right? You know, and uh, you can do whatever you want to do, right? But, but just like you just finished saying, it sometimes people don't really think about, right. you know. I, I, I'm just confess, I didn't until I heard the spill, and I decided I'd better because I don't have kids or anybody right. left. And, and I made the decision because I people say, you know, I go, no, 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 I don't, I don't have nothing. And so finally I bit the bullet and say, yeah, I'll do it. And so, like I say, if you get one, at least... And good for you. Person. Good for you for yeah. taking that step. And you do have something. Everybody has something. I know, and but, yeah. they need to designate where they want to go. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I think it's just a daunting process for anybody. I just recently lost mm -hmm. my husband last September. And so, of course, with everything else that was going on, right. that was the least. But I knew I had to do it. Right. I ha absolutely had to do it. You know, mm -hmm. we have a house, we have cars, you know. Right. And we only, only have one child, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so eventually, you know, it took me three months to get over it. Yes, you of know, course. And I just signed last week, actually. Oh, oh so like, congratulations. Oh, good. And it was, it actually, I thought it was going to be such a process. Yeah, it was easy. The yeah, person yeah. I used mm -hmm. was through the... Um, where the IOA is at Logic's Bank, the gentleman mm -hmm. there said I know somebody. We're going through that bank, we got a discount anyway. I had two meetings and a phone call and that was it. Good. Yeah. And so it is something that I agree with you, we should tell people. Right. And do you do that sort of workshop if we wanted to have one at our church? Yes. So usually I will come out and talk about the importance of giving and plan giving. 
if you want to have a, a, a lawyer, because I'm, I'm not an attorney and I don't do that, but I'm happy to work with a local lawyer, uh, a state attorney, to help make a joint presentation on it. And, it. and it depends on the church, right? We don't have a whole, people ask us, do we have a list of lawyers? Well, we don't because it's how many churches we have in all these different communities, and it should be community-based. But I'm happy to team up with somebody to do that. I do that a lot. Okay. Yes. It can also be considered as a gift. In, in what way? I'm sorry. For children. Oh yeah. Not little children, but children that are 25 to 40, mm -hmm. who aren't normally focusing that much. Right. And it's not an expensive thing necessarily, but it's a great gift to give to your children. Yep. To have their first trust. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. yeah. It is a great idea. Yeah. And, and they're not going to put anything in there for, you know, bequest, but at least it's set up. there's a good chance later on they might. Yeah, it's absolutely. Okay. It's a great idea. Um, because we were prompted, to, my wife and I were prompted to do this at the birth of our child, right? We did a living trust because a question that comes up is, who's going to take care of our children if something right. should happen? And that's where it's designated. Uh, advanced directives regarding health care can be part of your living trust. So now when, if we go into the hospital and we have a procedure, we have the, the advanced directive to give to the medical personnel. says so if something should happen, here's what you, what it, you follow. It, it takes away a lot of the angst right. that, that you had before. And, and I feel comfortable. And, and like I said, they can argue over it, but it's the fact. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then as part of this, as you're planning, you don't... You, you, you consider your heirs, your children, how do you want to divide up your estate, but you can also give a certain portion of it to charity and designate whatever yeah, charities yeah, you want. Yeah. It could be the church plus others, it could be other charities. Uh, it's a way to give beyond ourselves as part of our legacy and, and enduring to the church. And then it's up to you on how you restrict that gift or designate that gift. And the beauty is, you know, you can change it, but at least you've got something in practice right. in case mm -hmm. anything happens. Exactly. And that's the main thing. And my son came with me, and we've encouraged him, and so he's thinking about it. Right. You know, to do it even at his age. Right. And right. like I says, whatever you don't like in there, if other people don't like it, you can just say, oh, it was my mom, not me. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I ended up, I have no kids, and so I just dealt with it the way I dealt with it. Yeah. Perfect. Between me and my lawyer. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, yes. You just have to remember to keep it current. It's not just one time event. Yes. Yeah. You've got to keep maintaining it. Yeah, because this, this lawyer will call you back and give you new things and send you out. Yeah, you should probably review it yeah. um, you know, every five you to ten know. years yeah, to make sure it's know. up to date and reflects yeah. what you want or any changes. Yeah, in the I may law. change it. <laughs> I just want to say a little bit about IRAs. Um, That's interesting. The yeah. IRAs are becoming more and more, you know, they were started in the 80s, right? People started socking it's, away money. It's their retirement now. Yeah, and now they're retired, right. <laughs> uh, and the thing about IRAs, you know that when you retire and you get to yeah. 70 and a half because they start telling you how much, as you a got, minimum, yeah, you've got to take yeah, out, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, right. So you can do two things. As part of your will or trust or whatever, or just change the beneficiary on it, you can actually, at death, give your IRA to a charity or a portion of it, okay? Also, a great thing is, since 2008 and now, thank goodness, it's part of the law permanently. It had been year to year, and it had been done in December <laughs> each year. Congress has finally uh, uh, permitted that your required minimum distribution or more, up to $100,000, can be taken out of your IRA and given directly to a charity. And it's better than a charitable tax deduction, right? If you give money from your income, it's a, you get a tax yeah, deduction, you say it's great. This is you're not even counting the income. So if you have an IRA and you're taking out a minimum distribution, you say, I really don't want to take this because I'm going to be taxed on it. You can have that sent directly to the church, and you bypass that income. And it's a great way to give for your pledges, capital campaign, you name it. If you have an IRA, 70 and a half and older. Yeah. Yes? Well, I just turned 70 and a half and had to do that in December for the very first time. And mm -hmm. my son um, 
told me about it. We waited for that. We had to sit in it before the vote, but we were yeah. waiting for the vote. And so my contribution went to my church. See, perfect. And now, now you don't have to worry about the income tax on it, and your church got a direct gift. Yes, ma'am. Now, does it have to be an extra gift, or are you saying that people can use that towards their pledge? They can use it towards their pledge. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that would be a good option. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a wonderful option. I mean, option. we're hoping that they would give it extra. Mm -hmm. the, oh, yeah. but the check has to be written to the charity. Right. Not, yeah. not to you as an individual. Right. It has to go directly from right. whoever's got your IRA right. investment <laughs> directly to the charity. Now, it could be mailed to you, made out to whatever that charity is, and then you can deliver it. So the full amount way. can go directly to Absolutely. the church. Mm -hmm. Or part, like or part the full, the or as he said, if, if your distribution is less than 100000 you can do 100000 Right. But yep. what I'm saying is you could use it towards your pledge. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's up to you. You could designate it <laughs> extra. as you just as you just not, decide. You right. couldn't do that. Could be either. Right, right. Your battery's right. Your battery's uh -oh. going. <laughs> well, that means I better speak to this part real quick, huh? Yes, <laughs> board. Uh, I do, but I think I just have one thing there. That's okay. We'll get to it. So we know the, the benefits of a bequest now. You're giving a gift to charity. You get a state tax deduction if you need the tax deduction. It's a very simple gift, easy to implement. So I think you should make it as part of your planning. I do want you to know that our foundation provides for charitable gift annuities. And I want to describe what that is uh, quickly. Um, that is simply a contract between a donor and a charity. In this case, the donor is making a gift to the CalPAC United Methodist Foundation. We are in turn investing that in a separate investment pool that we have and we're paying you a fixed interest rate each year that we quote based on your age, okay? At your death, whatever remains that we have it paid out from that gift annuity goes to the charity you designate, in this case, the church. So here's a quick example before I lose power. <laughs> Bob Brown is 82 years old. Bob has $35,000 sitting in a money market that earns 0.25% or less. And Bob says, I want to do something with this money. I want to give it, but I need some money to live off of. I'm retired. I need fixed income. Bob decides to give that to CalPAC, uh, United Methodist Foundation. We invest it. And I quote Bob a 7.2% rate. I'm going to pay him 7.2% each year. Why am I paying Bob that high a rate? Because well, it's paid. he isn't going to live very long. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> what? We're, pay we're basing it on Bob's life expectancy. He gets this until death. So oh. it's whatever the life expectancy is for Bob oh. at 82 going on. So I can give him a higher rate, and I'm investing it in stocks and bonds that are going to earn me higher. I'm not investing it in CDs or T-bills, okay? okay? Okay. And then the IRS looks at this and says, Bob is going to give most of this money to charity in the end, right? Mm -hmm. When he passes away. So he gets an income tax deduction for that gift really? up front, right? So he's going to write off on his income taxes, in this case, $17,000 okay. as a charitable income tax deduction. Then I'm going to start sending Bob his annual interest, right? I can do it quarterly, send it to his account electronically is what we do, actually. 7.2% on $35,000 is $2,520 a year. Okay. He's getting that. Because the IRS looks at this as a charitable gift, most of that income interest income is tax-free. So now Bob gets the income tax deduction. He's getting mostly income, uh, interest income tax-free. And then when Bob passes away, the charity is going to get the remainder. I picked 17500 because that was just 50% of the gift. It could be higher or lower. What determines primarily how much the church gets is when Bob passes away. If Bob passes away before his life expectancy that this is based on, the church gift is going to be higher. If Bob lives till 100, there might not be any going to the church. <laughs> and I have those situations. I really do. I, but the, the worst the church can do is zero. Because I'm on the hook for the foundation in paying him that $2,520 each year. So there's no downside to the church on this. This is a great financial product. For those who want to give a gift to charity, they want that income tax deduction, they want fixed payments because they're on fixed income, and um, they, and then they benefit the charity at death. Now, 
if you're looking at it as a church, you say, okay, a bequest is the best, right? A, a, a bequest is the best because we get all of the money when the person passes away. But this is a great alternative for people who are retired, need the interest income, and still want to give to the church. Our contact information is there. If you want to do a gift annuity, we do these for churches. And you should know that. And we do them at a much lower cost than you will get for any. We don't charge a fee, actually, than you would for any of the uh, other community foundations who will often charge you a 2 to 3% fee and then ask for a portion of the gift to come to them. So if you want to benefit your church through charitable gift annuities, please make sure to contact us, and I'll work with the individual on it. Okay? okay? Curiosity question. Yep. Are you investing this the same way you invest in endowment funds? Uh, a little bit more conservatively. We have a separate okay. investment manager, a little more fixed income, Okay. because we want that income stream coming in. It's about 50-50. Okay. Yeah. And we have, under California, as you might guess, some states are very lax on it. California has very strict reserves that you have to have against each gift of doing. Okay. So we have to invest it and then make sure we are properly reserved for the uh, liability that we have for the gift annuities being paid out. Because i got to be protected in case I have somebody live till 100 and have enough reserve set aside to pay that. Mm -hmm. So it's all one pool. It one is one pool. So I manage less, it. Less management. Yeah. Right. So I, ma I manage uh, our gift annuities are about uh, $3 million that I manage as a separate pool. Okay. So that's long-term giving. That helps your endowment and your and your long-term funds. General questions uh, that you may have about any of this. I've covered a lot of ground on both regular but you stewardship. you will come and out and do some kind of presentation. I'm happy to do so. Please just contact me, email me. Do you have a card? Do you have a card? Uh, because we do have an it's on here. It's on okay. Did you take over from, is it Jack? Jack? Yes, Jan Berenson Jan was my predecessor. She uh, was a late person. She had served for 20 years uh, and retired uh, three years ago. And that's when I took and over. And she opened ours. Uh -huh. And we've been very lax that we're supposed to meet every quarter but we haven't done and so this would be a good idea now to have a new person around, and I will certainly take it back. Please do. I'm happy to do so. Um, I usually come on a Sunday. Uh, I can, I'll attend worship or if the pastor wants me to preach, I can preach and then do a presentation afterwards is usually uh, what people do. Or if you want me to just talk to your committee when you meet, like your finance or your stewardship committee on a weeknight. I'm happy to do that too. Well, we can arrange to have an endowment meeting um, on right. a sun on a Sunday after our meeting. Whatever works for service. you. Uh, if you're going to get me on a Sunday, I'm just uh, I get a lot of requests, so right. book me out um, uh, ahead of time. Well, I will check on Sunday because yeah. say, we haven't had anybody else. Right. Since do we have enough cards to go around? Do you guys get one? I have no idea. Okay. Right. And I got these. Okay. Here, Were there any other cards that came around? Thank you very much. It was a, I so I, I, um, I also deal with you with UNW. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Other questions? Yes. I'm still having a little trouble with this charitable gift. Yes. Ability. Why wouldn't someone just uh, give that upon death? They can. That there's that. Um, it, I'd say the only reason they don't do it is if they have money sitting in a low interest bearing account right now that they're not earning anything from but they need interest income to live off of and then want to benefit the charity at death if they need to use it that way then a gift annuity makes sense if they can put that money in a better account higher interest account there aren't that many out there uh higher interest than the gift annuity they, they could they could but they may be adverse to risk yeah. Right. Well, I mean, this locks it in. Risk while you're living, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. So yeah, I like that I, guaranteed thing. When I enter into it, it's an actual contract. Yeah. And I'm, I am fixing, the interest rate never changes. So That's when I quote deal. them the rate and I and I fix it, they yeah. know I'm going to get X percent for however long yeah. we live. No, I think it's, it's the interest rate mm -hmm. guarantee versus the risk of something higher. Like an, if you're like, going to be in the equity market. So you so could something higher has more yeah, risk. Yeah, like the stock market just went. But, you're, but Ed, you're right. It's more advantageous for the church 
if the person just wants to give the money outright from their estate in the will or bequest, because right. you know you're getting 100% of whatever it is. Yeah. Other questions? Do you have a copy of the presentation? Uh, I'm happy to email it to you. Yes. So if you leave me, as you leave your, your email, I'm happy to email it. Both, do you want both PowerPoints? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, yeah. Oh, could you do that? Yep, just leave me your email, and I'm happy to email the, power, the presentations to you. Anything else? Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you for your sharing and your attention, and please give me a call as you uh, go through this, okay? Very important. Okay, bye-bye. Oh, yeah. <laughs>